number of my friends that, that have uh, contributed to this thing. Um, I've used a little bit of information from Shirley Render's book and uh, Bruce Gowans, who was a long term, long time CAHS researcher, uh, gave me uh, some information on this, uh, uh, this uh, Prairie Air Mail. And uh, uh, Gord Mallet, who is uh, uh, an excellent uh, uh, philatelist on air, air mails, uh, living in Kelowna, he has also helped. And then I have to uh, acknowledge as well uh, the Hall of Fame, uh, the Sears, Tom Sears collection of photos has been very wonderful to uh, a contribution. Uh, my old friend, Frank Kelly, who was the base manager uh, at uh, Western Canada Airways in Calgary, he's contributed things. Well, he hasn't contributed recently. It was 32 years ago, but, and uh, uh, Doug Anderson, uh, who many of you may know has been a big contributor to CAHS stuff with uh, his uh, many drawings and whatnot. He located some microfilms of the Fokker F-14s in the bowels of the um, Federal Aviation Agency. And he gave me those microfilms, which allowed me to do some drawings of it. So uh, that being said, let's go to uh, slide two there, please, uh, Jim. Okay, well, uh, not too many years after Wright Brothers and Lindbergh and Alcock and Brown, uh, the, the public in Canada wanted to see airmail. And the first airmails were, of course, uh, the Quebec North Shore, which was uh, inaccessible in the winter, and the Red Lake uh, Gold Rush, which uh, Western Canada Airways uh, were the, the big participants. And uh, so we see these uh, Western Canada Airways Fokker st standard universals uh, lined up somewhere uh, waiting to take airmail. Uh, the uh, the uh, level Canadian prairies was deemed to be uh, a safe place to start a scheduled airmail. And uh, the uh, planners thought one day could be saved over rail travel if the airplanes picked up the mail at Winnipeg and uh, flew 658 miles to Calgary. And uh, so that was the impetus to, to start this scheduled airmail. Uh, and I should maybe go on to just one other uh, detail here too. Uh, nowadays, people who fly with reference to the ground called VFR flying, uh, it's the first step in a flying license. Well, it was the only step in uh, the commercial licenses in the, the mid 1920s. There was no IFR, no, no flying without reference to the ground other than some transatlantic aviators who could, uh, could uh, fly for long periods in weather over the Atlantic, but they could never uh, do blind takeoffs or blind landings, which came very much in the future. So, uh, that being said, uh, let's go to the next slide there, please, Jim. So one of James A. Richardson's friends in the aviation business in, uh, uh, in uh, Canadian Vickers thought he would uh, uh, give uh, Western Canada Airways a first chance at uh, trying their uh, an imported DH-61 giant moth. And it had a 500 horsepower Bristol Jupiter engine it was a pretty powerful airplane. It was flown out in August of 28 uh, by uh, Jack Caldwell. And uh, you see uh, Lee Brintnell standing with Jack Caldwell in that picture. Next slide, Jim. So it, it, uh, it was big news and uh, your, your Manitoba Premier Bracken was a gutsy sort of gentleman. He, he wanted to ride on the thing. so. Uh, he got in it and uh, they uh, did the first flight from Winnipeg and it was intended to be done within a day, but it turned out there was very high winds out of the West and it took almost two days to get to Calgary. And uh, from then it, it uh, made news and uh, flew around Calgary and Edmonton a bit. Next slide, Jim. 
and it made big news, new plane for the Western service. And uh, it was a, a scaled up version of the de Havilland moth. And uh, people were very enthusiastic for airmail, judging by the, uh, the papers of the, those days. Anyhow, it was uh, set to return to Winnipeg on uh, next slide, Jim. Uh, it had suffered a little bit of structural damage in a heavy landing and uh, uh, Buck Buchanan, the pilot and uh, three passengers uh, just left Calgary and they got about five miles east somewhere around Chestermere Lake when uh, uh, it became apparent they had a structural failure and uh, Buck put the airplane down on the ground and, and uh, then all hell broke loose and it burned. And uh, thought to be due to that hitting the ground on a previous flight. Uh, it was uh, it uh, very much uh, seemed to end the giant moth as a uh, uh, as a contender in the uh, airmail service. Following this uh, trial, let's go to the next slide, Jim. Uh, Western Canada Airways decided to use their bush fleet uh, to uh, to do some trial airmail, and this occurred uh, in the uh, late months of 1928. And they were using their bush fleet, uh, like the Fokker CASK, and uh, uh, they uh, they started discovering what sort of problems there were in flying the airmail. Across the prairies. Next one, Jim. And so all, all of these uh, bush pilots that uh, Western Canada Airways had, and, and I counted 11 of them that were uh, doing the airmail, um, they were all very brave people. Uh, most of them had been uh, in the first war uh, fighting somebody. And uh, they they didn't uh, they didn't mind uh, some adversity in their flying and and uh, uh, it was it, it was very much very well received by the public as you can see from the newspaper articles anyhow next slide anyhow. Uh, as they got into it here in November of 1928, uh, here Buck Buchanan uh, flew uh, very low uh, under clouds, an average of 100 feet uh, passing from Regina to Winnipeg. Now, um, those of you who fly, uh, that's known as scud running uh, nowadays. And, and it's uh, certainly kind of dangerous because it could be any time that the clouds could drop and uh, you would find yourself uh, hit hitting the ground. Uh, next uh, slide. And here was another case uh, in that same month, uh, Andy Cruikshank was forced to return to Winnipeg. He flew almost all the way out at 200 feet and under uh, in a total flight time of 55 minutes and uh, probably got pretty well scared. So next slide. And uh, here was another case where Andy Cruikshank uh, was finding it impossible to fly under the clouds. So he flew over the clouds in uh, what is known now as, as VFR on top. But uh, nowadays uh, you check with the destination airdrome to make sure that's open and going to stay open. Anyhow, uh, uh, Andy made it through and uh, was able to uh, to land in Winnipeg, and uh, unfortunately, also at that time, the uh, the very uh, primitive Calgary Airport was on the west side of the city with only a north south runway, and it had three attempts to take off crosswind at Calgary, and uh, uh, that also caused problems. Next slide. So with, with these uh, um, uh, early trial flights, uh, the postmaster uh, F.T. Kulikan uh, sent a letter to Lee Brentnell expressing his concern about the difficulties with headwinds. 
and their very tight schedules. And the big problem, of course, was in the, uh, they were flying some of these with standard universals, which only had 200 horsepower and, and about a 90 mile an hour uh, airspeed and uh, could be, it could be cut easily to 60 or 70 in the, in the uh, Chinook winds that blew out of the West. So next slide. So the, the trial air mails kind of ended uh, in late December 1928, and the newspapers, uh, of course, were still very optimistic of, uh, of the air mails continuing, and, uh, and which was uh, evident in all of the, uh, all of the Western newspapers. Uh, next slide. Now, one thing that was determined uh, uh, in these trial air mails was that if they were going to fly at night, they were going to need rotating beacons to, for the uh, pilots to find their way. Uh, uh, this is a rotating beacon about 24 inches in, in diameter, uh, fairly bright lights in it. There's an example of one of these uh, in the Calgary Museum. They were fairly common in the early days. And these were made in, in the US by uh, Sperry. And uh, the, uh, the US, which was also experimenting with uh, airmail at night, uh, was also using uh, lighting so uh, to find their way. Next slide. And uh, the, the, the landing, the floodlights on the airports, they were uh, specially made to uh, hopefully to uh, to flood the whole airport and yet not shine into the pilot's face uh, trying to land. So, okay, next slide. Uh, typical electric rotating beacon. They, they were set on about 50 foot high towers and that's one of those 24 inch uh, lights up there, electric light. Uh, next slide. And uh, this is another detail of that. Uh, these are from an old 1929 manual I have. Uh, the other problem they had in Canada was that uh, the rural uh, areas of uh, Manitoba and Saskatchewan and Alberta did not have electric power. Rural electrification didn't occur um, until the 1950s. So unlike today where you where you fly over uh, the prairies at night and uh, every cattle farm has got a thousand watt light uh, illuminating his, his barn and his, his cattle pens and whatnot, um, it was dead black at night in 1928-29. So uh, that was the real problem. Now the other problem was uh, these uh, Electric beacons could only be installed. Um, uh, they, they figured about 30 miles was about all the furthest they could see. And so they had to put in some other intermediate uh, beacons and they were actually uh, uh, acetylene lights and something like antique cars, I guess from the twenties or earlier, uh, the acetylene was made by uh, calcium carbide tablets that uh, were immersed in water and they produced acetylene. However, they blew out lots of times and they weren't very, um, weren't, weren't very reliable and they couldn't be seen for further than about 10 miles. So um, despite uh, all these attempts at lighting, uh, we did start having problems. And uh, let's go on to the next one. So we'll go into the airplanes. Now, uh, in those days, it seemed that uh, the pilots, airmail pilots, preferred to fly open cockpit. And so all the airplane, airmail airplanes, uh, several different uh, brands uh, produced in the US, Fokker and uh, uh, Boeings and uh, and uh, well, different ones. They all had the pilot situated in the rear in an open cockpit. 
and his visibility was not good. Next slide. And the Boeing, similarly, the pilot was situated in the back, uh, uh, trying to peer over a, a, about a four foot wide cabin uh, that's uh, 20, 25 feet long in front of him. And uh, it uh, certainly, it made landings difficult in tight fields. Next slide. Uh, the, the first Fokker that was ordered um, was a, a pretty fancy model. It, it had been a factory demonstrator at, at Fokker and it, uh, it uh, situated here in the Rutledge hangar in Calgary. And uh, we had a professional photographer in Calgary by the name of Ken Hyde who gave me this picture. And uh, you can tell that it's AIG because the, the uh, factory serial number uh, maker serial number is painted on the on the fabric just ahead of the undercarriage leg there and this airplane of course had a, a machine turned cowling and it was very fancy I believe it was uh, red in color uh, with uh, silver uh, or aluminum polished aluminum and ribbed aluminum uh, top and bottom and uh, the wing was uh, varnished as done on Fokkers. Uh, next slide. So some of the other things uh, I'm asking you to kind of observe here. Uh, this was a one of the two drawings that I uh, produced of this airplane type. And, and uh, it's, uh, it was a, a rare type. Six of them were, were introduced by, uh, purchased by Western Canada Airways. Uh, and they were in the CF uh, registration series, AIG, and, A and so on. Uh, but you can tell from this drawing here how difficult it was to, to look from that pilot's perch at the back of the airplane under that great long wing that was only about 12 inches above the, above the fuselage. And you have to kind of aim yourself at the small airports that they had and uh, and uh, look, if you had to look forward, you had to look well to either side of the cockpit. They did come with landing lights. And one of the features on this airplane was a, a great long adjustment handle that could be moved to, to lower the landing lights and also to change the angle of the landing lights. So depending on the, uh, the uh, approach angle of the airplane, you could, I guess, sort of get some light on the ground. So next slide, Jim. Um, we have a, a very interesting first person uh, account of this uh, on a, should we call it, it was a, a trial flight in one of these Fokker airplanes, and two of the Fokker airplanes, uh, just about three days before the, the initial official start of the airmail and it occurred on this flight this uh, situation occurred on uh, uh, I got to refer to my notes here for a second one of the last proving flights using the new Fokker F14 was only five days before the official mail start occurring on February 26 1930 pilot uh, F Roy Brown seen on the right here flew on the night flight from Moose Jaw to Calgary he was accompanied, among others, by a non-fare paying passenger, Frederick Watt. Now, some of you uh, who uh, have watched uh, Edmonton newspapers and uh, uh, of that day, uh, Watt reported in part, he, he took part in a lot of aviation events and went to uh, um, the uh, mineral deposits up at Great Bear Lake and whatnot. And so he was very keen on aviation. And he reported in part, the first hour or so out of Moose Jaw, the visibility was perfect, near swift current, snow squalls intervened. If the weather had changed there, there was no way of Brown knowing. Then the worst happened. Visibility became non-existent as a large sized blizzard took, shook the, took the plane to its heart in a convulsive embrace. 
Brown was left to his uncertain magnetic compass and his skilled airman's instinct for survival. Ultimately, Brown broke into the clear air on the other side of the turbulence. Eventually, the revolving beam from Medicine Hat's tower led us to the runway lights. We were scheduled to continue to Calgary immediately, but head office said to talk to Farrington, seen here on the left, uh, who had not been heard of for, since he had taken off from Calgary eastbound. When the expected arrival time passed, the atmosphere grew tense in the little terminal. Uh, then shortly before daylight, the phone rang. Farrington was down in an emergency field near Bassano. He apologized for not having called earlier, but explained that it had taken a while to find a farm and a phone while stumbling through the darkness and falling snow. The storm kept getting thicker and thicker. And finally, I, Farrington, knew it was common sense to sit down when I still knew where I was. The short, unladen, untended field at Bassano was pretty short on a bad night. Picked up a barbed wire fence with my landing gear, only some scratch paintwork when I untangled it. Both runs had to be completed in daylight on February 26th. So uh, that's a first person account of a, a newspaperman riding in a, a, a scary airplane flight in uh, VFR at night in the Canadian prairies. Uh, about this time, the merger of airline elements of WCA became Canadian Air, Airways Limited, but we'll continue on referring to the company as WCA. So uh, next slide. Uh, just uh, one more view of the, the Boeing. They were used in the States as well, and uh, we'll see a restored example here shortly. So. Uh, let's continue on. Uh, next slide, Jim. So with great fanfare, the uh, the uh, official service started. And uh, of course, the uh, post office brought the mail out in their Model T van and the, the poor pilot, uh, all dressed in his uh, heavy clothes, met it and uh, put the mail in the in the uh, in the cabin. Now the 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 cabin was made to to carry up to six people in it. Uh, WCA had uh, contemplated having passenger service as well, which was unlike the American uh, uh, mail service. And they also had um, a locked up cabin uh, at the front of the main cabin which could serve either as a lavatory or, uh, uh, or they put the mail in, in that, uh, that location. The post office insisted on locked mail. So if, uh, if they wanted to keep the lavatory, there was also a smaller mail compartment under the pilot somewhere in the back. So uh, next slide. So the grand commencement of the Prairie Air Mail uh, almost simultaneously on that date, the uh, WCA mail planes launched from seven bases on the prairie cities. The various routes were portrayed by, on the en envelopes with various historical pictures. And uh, my, my father, who was 19, and his older brother at that time were uh, airmail collectors, and they sent mail around to uh, a number of different places so that they could get... Uh, uh, airmail letters such as uh, these first covers that uh, they very much valued. Uh, next slide. Yeah, next slide, that's it. So there's a very nice, uh, the, the caches that were stamped on these were, were different for each route. And uh, if we can just go back one, please, uh, Jim. That, that's, a real prize one showing a, a, a native person, uh, moose jaw to medicine hat. And that was only used on that route. And uh, uh, that was one of my father's mail. So anyhow, forward one slide. And that was my uncle's one. 
And this is one that I really prize. It was uh, signed by pilot Roy Brown. And my uncle, I think, hung around the airports to uh, after the mail was distributed to run back to get Roy Brown to sign it. So next slide. Um, so we'll go on to um, the, the major events on the problems on these routes. Uh, and I just got to get my... Okay, I'm located here. Uh, in the, the following two years and 28 days, which was the uh, duration of this airmail, uh, there was a numerous mishaps on the open prairies and at the airports requiring extensive repairs. And in some cases, write-offs, total write-offs. A selection of the more prominent and newsworthy events follows. Uh, next slide. It, it was only 21 days after the official start that F-14 AIG uh, was flying from Winnipeg towards uh, Regina and uh, found itself in snow and fog. Pilot Buck Buchanan again and passenger mechanic Al Dine ran into snow. No beacon was visible. They uh, were down very low and ran into a hill. Uh, both were uninjured. Uh, they borrowed an undercarriage leg from another uh, Fokker and uh, uh, they were able to ferry it back to Winnipeg on April 1st, uh, you know, about six days later. Test flown June 3rd after repairs fully nine weeks later. So next slide. So you can see the sort of field work that has to be done out in the prairies. Uh, they have to get a whole bunch of people there with uh, fuel drums and uh, lots of uh, wood and, and jacks and whatnot. And uh, those very slender undercarriage legs broke. In this case, they both broke, and so there was no wing damage. Um, another uh, thing happened, uh, event happened uh, uh, not long after that, April 29th, 1930, CFAIG flying from Winnipeg uh, towards westbound. Uh, it only got as far as Rosser, Manitoba, which is barely well, it's, I think it's in the city of Winnipeg now. Uh, and they ran into, uh, Harold Farrington, the pilot, ran into fog shortly after takeoff, 15 miles from Winnipeg Airport. No injuries, but AIJ was damaged beyond repair. Now, pilot Farrington, he was a kind of a character, uh, typically a man short of words. He phoned Winnipeg to report, and when asked about the airplane, he answered, it ain't. Uh, the lucky passenger on that airplane, he was spared of injury, but perhaps not of fear. He was able to proceed by train the next day. Uh, June, a few months later, uh, June 12, 1930, Boeing uh, AIO was damaged beyond repair when it hit a flood lamp while landing at Moose Jaw in gusty weather. So Boeings weren't immune to crashes. Uh, next slide, Jim. Okay, and we'll pass over that one. Next slide. So with the, uh, the loss of the aircraft so far, WCA ordered another mail plane, this time a consolidated Fleetster, having an aluminum monocoque fuselage and a somewhat faster route speed of 110 miles per hour. Now these, uh, all of these airplanes had uh, uh, the early, uh, Pratt & Whitney Hornet engine of 1,690 cubic inches, but they only put out 525 horsepower. So uh, they were just an oversized version of the early early uh, Pratt & Whitney Wasp of, of 1340. Uh, so, uh, uh, and the Fokkers had a had a flying speed, uh, airspeed of about somewhere around 100 miles per hour. So uh, another horrible thing happened. Uh, next slide, slide 33. Uh, September 25th, 1930, the Boeing AIN 
flying from Calgary to Southwest Saskatchewan, pilot Pat Holden crashed in the fog, killing Holden and two passengers, and the aircraft <coughs> went off. And uh, that was uh, a very sad event for the uh, for the airline because uh, the company doctor was killed on that on that flight. Now. Uh, a lot of you people are aviation people, and as incredible as it may sound in that aviation today is a most, the most regulated government activity in Canada, there was no regu regulation on weather minima for flying at that time. And with the operational experience of the preceding 11 months, WECA manager Lee Brintnell now decided to have his own operating menu minimums before making a flight. The forecast clouds were now to be at a minimum height 500 feet above ground with a minimum horizontal vis visibility of one mile. By way of comparison, the present established VFR legal minimums now are one mile visibility in daytime and three miles at night with 500 feet of cloud base above the airplane flying at 500 feet above ground. And that is required, of course, because uh, well, nowadays, of course, an IFR airplane can come out of the clouds and, and uh, they don't want it dropping onto a VFR airplane under the cloud. But uh, unfortunately, Brintnell's new specified operating limitations, it seemed it didn't end the carnage. So the next several slides, uh, we'll start with the first one. Uh, we have miles and miles of open prairie. Uh, in Saskatchewan, uh, uh, there's 20, I read what it was. Well, those of you who have driven across Saskatchewan, uh, we call it the uh, um, crossing the straw curtain. Uh, there's miles and miles of dead flat Saskatchewan uh, prairie and wheat and whatnot. And poor Ted Stull, uh, landing blind in fog, he should come across a small granary at the end of this. Uh, this I should point out this is uh, this photo is some that were taken by uh, uh, they were in the uh, Tom Sears collection at the Aviation Hall of Fame. Next slide. So you can see there, uh, undercarriage broken, uh, the belly all wrecked. Uh, the wingtip wrecked, the uh, prop wrecked, uh, and viewing it the next morning, you can see a heavy frost crust of frozen fog on the wings. Uh, clearly showed the, the weather that they had that night. Next slide. And uh, there it was a write-off. And that huge 59-foot wing was, was damaged, and it, was, it would require a difficult transport to a warm repair hangar. This damage, as well as the engine and undercarriage, resulted in the write-off. Next slide. Fallen from the sky, damage beyond repair. Next slide. And here it is, a, a, a very close-up uh, score. The granary one, the airplane zero. Uh, that's definitely the granary uh, roof that's visible there. So next slide. So about this time, the, the routes Moose Jaw to Calgary were rerouted through Lethbridge, anticipating a future mountain route uh, through the UBC and adding a new peril. Lethbridge is noted for its high winds uh, blowing through the Crow's Nest Pass from the west. The big lumbering F-14s experienced difficulty in ground handling and winds due to the free castering tailwheel and weak handbrakes. Dangling wing rope wingtip ropes, let's go to the next slide, uh, were added uh, using uh, ladders to access the, uh, the wingtip hooks, uh, handholds, and uh, these were left on the F-14s for assisting the ground crews. And this was noted uh, to me in a 1982 interview by Frank Kelly. And Frank is, uh, is standing on that access platform there, and how he how he talked the uh, the uh, the lovely lady from the uh, the WCA office 
to sit on the oily cowling. I'm, I'm not sure, but Frank Kelly was a charmer. Now we'll go to the next one. I've, I've had some personal experience in, uh, in flying into Lethbridge. Uh, it's, uh, it's downwind of the open uh, uh, Crow's Nest Pass and my newly restored 1933 Waco. I left Calgary in a dead calm and I arrived in Lethbridge in a 20 knot wind coming out of the west. The landing was accomplished okay, but trying to taxi back down this runway, the cable operated handbrake was unable to prevent my airplane from weather cocking into wind on numerous attempts. Even with my wife passenger kicked out of the airplane to wing walk, it was still uncontrollable. The, uh, the tower radio operator summoned some burly guys from the flying club to wrestle my airplane to the parking area as uh, uh, the Time Air airline was coming in shortly. So uh, next slide. Uh, I, I'm out of order here a little bit, but uh, May 13th, 1931, uh, another airplane was added to the fleet, a Pit Pitcairn Air Mail 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 Wing CFACT had been transferred from the Eastern operations to replace lost equipment. On departing Medicine Hat, it suffered an engine failure and pilot uh, Herbert Hollock Kenyon was uninjured, the airplane written off. Now he was a superb pilot. He uh, took American explorers uh, across the Antarctic uh, um, ice field and how it was that he uh, didn't set the airplane down without damaging it, I'll, I'll never know. But uh, anyhow, uh, next slide, uh, Jim. Oh, uh, L, uh, okay. Um, February 20th, 1931, AIH uh, was flying from Winnipeg to, uh, to Bagot. I forget where that was. Pilot Norm Forrester and two pilots passengers ran into fog, crashed and burned while trying to turn out of the fog bank. The, uh, the one passenger was uh, the uh, doctor who served uh, Western Canada Airways. Uh, pilot Forrester recovered from his injuries and went on to a stellar airline pilot career with Canadian Pacific Airlines until his retirement in 1958. Uh, uh, about that time in uh, 1931, March 4th to be exact, the hangar occupied by WCA at Western at Winnipeg's Stevenson Field burned. Uh, all that remained of the hangar and the aircraft was a mess of smoldering debris. Uh, Fokker AII, which Buchanan had flown in from Regina two hours previously, was uh, was destroyed. So. Uh, I, uh, one other event here, uh, June 15th, uh, 31, pilot Ted Stull flew the first commercial radio beam flight flying Fokker AIJ on a flight from Winnipeg to Moose Jaw. And all <laughs> the although the flight was a success, the radio beam equipment was not available for the entire routing and no further development was done on that. Probably it was recognized that the government cancellation was imminent and further costs were not likely to be borne. So uh, September 3rd, 1931, AIK, Lethbridge to Calgary, pilot Andy Cruikshank suffered an undercarriage failure at the Calgary Field. Next slide. It uh, again, it uh, damaged some wingtip and uh, undercarriage and whatnot. Uh, the WCA base mechanics, Frank Kelly, Bob Hodgins, and Sid Willis worked with a local house moving crew to lift and move the crippled airplane into the nearby Rutledge hangar and to make the undercarriage and wingtip repairs. Next slide. <laughs> so there's the crew uh, uh, that uh, was fixing Andy Cruikshank's uh, little accident. Uh, Frank Kelly is the middle guy in that picture. Uh, Frank got married later in the, in the 30s and instead of uh, uh, a lonesome uh, career on various uh, northern bases, he had a wife who fe fed him very well and he became a, uh, uh, he, he acquired a, a rather stout profile and uh, 
I never knew him when he was skinny like that. Next slide. So as it happened, uh, the, the Fleetster AIP was landing at Calgary. It overran the available space and crashed into a hangar. That expensive airplane was written off. Pilot Paul Garton was uninjured. The brakes were blamed. A comment to the author, to me, in a 1990 interview with local pilot Phil Lucas indicated that Garton frequently did fast and close in hotshot landings. And uh, perhaps the higher stall speed of this airplane can contributed to the problem. Uh, next slide. And uh, that's Calgary Airport uh, uh, in, at that time. And if you look all over almost to the edge, the right edge, uh, that is the Fleetster still sitting up against the hangar it ran into. And you look to the, the, the left edge, and that is the Rutledge hangar, which uh, was the big hangar that was uh, used for, uh, it was uh, lots of air, air operators used that. And uh, that hangar is still in, in use in Calgary. It's, uh, uh, it's now a gymnasium for a boys club. The, uh, the roll away doors have been replaced with an insulated wall, a new roof on it. And if you recall that picture uh, of AIG, uh, the new airplane uh, sitting in the hangar, uh, that was that same Rutledge hangar. So we're very, we aviation historians are very, very pleased to, uh, to uh, have that still in Calgary. So uh, next, uh, there it is close up. All of these from the, uh, the Sears collection with the Hall of Fame. Next slide. And uh, all, all through that airmail uh, experience, there was uh, rubberneckers around the airport to see airplanes leaving. Next slide. Unfortunately, May, March 31st, 1932, the federal government in a cost cutting, cutting move canceled the four year Prairie Airmail contract. Governments of the day were, were careful about deficits, uh, not like today. Uh, this is rather a nasty cover on that, uh, that mail. I guess it was a, uh, it, uh, was a sad commentary on the, the end of the airmail. For the, perhaps for the struggling crews of WCA, it was a relief. In the short two year and 28 dur day duration of the service, there were five lives lost and eight airplanes written off. Perhaps for the pilots, there was just too un much uncertainty of arriving at the destination. Next slide. Uh, although this fatality count was bothersome, it paled in comparison to the lives lost, for instance, on the 1936 Imperial Airways pioneering flying boat flights from Britain to the, uh, the Empire, India and South Africa. In the first two years of operation of the short S3, there was eight major fatal accidents with a whole bunch more uh, fatalities. Uh, anyhow, it was... Uh, in Canada, it was a devastating financial blow to the struggling WCA CAL company and its principal financier, J. A. Richardson. He'd counted on the four-year contract to write off the purchased airplanes, hangars, maintenance facilities, and the liabilities. Uh, next slide. It was certainly an unfriendly and ill-informed federal government which reneged on its mail contract and failed to provide continuing financial support for the struggling industry. It would be later in the 30s that the Prairie Route would again be serviced, but at this time with faster airplanes, newly developed instrument flying skills. Uh, many of you would recall that the Air Force was teaching pilots uh, IFR flying from uh, Borden in 1932. Uh, the uh, newly developed instrument flying skills and full instrument capabilities provided uh, at destination airports. It was pretty good. All of this was being funded for the taxpayers airline, TransCanada Airlines. Uh, the, uh, 
they also had possibilities of connecting on transocean routes uh, with Pan Am and Imperial Airways. Uh, so uh, having a Trans Canada airline was uh, a very desirable th thing to have. And that was only seven years after the cancellation of the Prairie Airmail, but with skills and equipment light years ahead in development. Um, next slide. Some of the F-14s soldiered on flying on special contracts, such as the summer delivery of the Edmonton grads basketball team from uh, Edmonton to, to a game in Calgary. Departure from the Edmonton ramp seen here. The two remaining F-14s uh, sometime after this were reduced to spares in the uh, fall of 1932. And uh, you might ask is, you know, is there an F-14 uh, uh, still uh, around uh, as a restored uh, aircraft and thankfully no. Uh, they were not a good airplane. The uh, next uh, slide, uh, Jim. The the uh, there was two Boeing forty B fours that were uh, leased, uh, and uh, BFAMP was subsequently sold to a fish hall operation in northern Alberta. Engine failure resulted in this remaining forty H four crashing and burning. Uh, here we see visible evidence that the aft pilot seat was safer than a, than a forward position. Anyhow, the last aeronautical vestiges of Richardson's 1930 vision were gone. Uh, so the question comes, why did the Fokker airplane suffer so many undercarriage failures? Well, in 1930, uh, aviation design principles were still primitive, barely able to quantify structural flight loads. Landing loads, that of dropping an airplane onto a runway, was not so clearly defined. The F-14 mail plane, by its peculiar design, having stilt-like uh, undercarriage legs, was, was equipped with a pri proprietary gruss strut on each leg. The available tubing to fit the strut, shock strut was not sufficiently large enough for an adequate factor of safety against buckling under the primitive uh, Canadian flying conditions. So uh, I have some personal thoughts and, and experiences of this uh, latter day, uh, in this latter day. Uh, next slide, Jim, please. Um, in more than 30 years, 50 years around Calgary, most of my personal flying has been under VFR conditions and mostly in vintage airplanes restored by myself. My base has always been an unlighted grass field my primitive airplanes, having poor forward visibility, have been a challenge to land in the daylight. Uh, for business and pleasure, I've crossed the prairies to the east from Calgary, to Moose Jaw, to Winnipeg and beyond, and to Saskatoon uh, over 70 times. That is 35 round trips. And northbound to Edmonton and back some 80 times, 40 round trips. Although the routes are over flat prairies, as in the 30s, Direct flights do not follow meandering railways. There's frequently challenging weather, formidable head headwinds, occasional low cloud conditions require what today is derisively called scud running. Occasional delays have recalled, uh, re required my night stops. Next slide. I've had a really neat experience arriving in the ca cabin of a uh, the Boeing 40 mail plane restored by Spokane, Washington aviator Addison Pemberton. The closed cabin feels reminiscent to riding in a train. Uh, you see Addison sitting at that aft position, just, uh, just barely visible behind the, the top wing. Uh, the, uh, the, a train enjoys a 100% chance of arriving at the destination, where the mail planes in 1930 did not. In today's hindsight, I don't think I would ever had the guts to ride in a VFR night flying Boeing or Fokker as did the passengers of 1930. Um, uh, next slide. I, I should also comment riding in the cabins of these 1930 airplanes was not like riding in a present day jet airliner. Passengers did not ride in vibrationless comfort. The pounding din of the large unmuffled piston engine 
exhausting, barely below the plywood floor, cabin floor, produced a cabin noise in the level of 120 to 150 decibels, enough to shake the wax out of a person's ears. There was no forward visibility in the claustrophobic cabin. The air, airplane wallowed mightily in the up and down in the turbulent air, uh, frequently uh, seen over the prairies. And there was no informative or comforting assurances given by a smiling flight attendant. So I, I really have to admire this, this young lady that's uh, taking one of the last flights out of, out of uh, Winnip, out of Moose Jaw, I guess. So uh, the notable achievements and epilogue, despite the obvious problems with equipment and lack of pilot flying, flying skills, these, this pioneering venture achieved a completion record of 92.8%. That compared favorably with the 93% of the American carriers. Out of the 4,864 4, trips WCA scheduled between the different points, 4,512 uh, were completed on sh as scheduled, 292 were not attempted, 24 were attempted but abandoned, and 36 partly completed and mail sent on by rail. So I will end it with uh, one uh, comment that uh, came from uh, uh, Ernie K. Gann's novel, The Aviator, where he described the men employed in the carrying of airmail. He said, they were instinctively obliged to continue in a profession, which was opening new frontiers almost daily. Practicing it was still an art. It paid them modestly in money, but lavishly in broken bones and death. So that ends my uh, presentation.